today I'm going to be talking about um, beyond the first picture of a black hole. But before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit more just about this general idea of imaging the invisible. So many things that we want to take pictures of are actually invisible to us. For instance, we can't take a picture of our brain using a standard camera. And in these cases, it's impossible to directly the image the thing we want to see. And so we have to develop alternative ways to take indirect measurements. For instance, using something like an MRI scanner. Um, in these cases, the measurements don't look anything like the image we're trying to capture. And so we have to design algorithms that work with the new kind of sensing system, understand it in order to recover the desired picture that we're after. And this isn't just true in medical imaging, but in a range of many different applications, a field referred to as computational photography or computational imaging. And as just an example, using this methodology, my group has been working on techniques to estimate um, objects material properties, improve medical imaging, see under the ground uh, using with, uh, to understand earthquakes. And but today I'm going to be talking about how we can use uh, this methodology of computational imaging to reveal what I think of as kind of being the ultimate invisible, and that's black holes. So black holes are one of the most mysterious phenomena in the universe. And scientists have been studying them ever since they were first predicted from Einstein's theory of general relativity just over 100 years ago. And in particular, for decades, scientists have been studying this giant elliptical galaxy that's at the head of the Virgo constellation. So this galaxy is called M87. It's 55 million light years away from us, and it's really special because over 100 years ago, someone actually discovered this streak of light on the sky which ended up being a galactic scale jet of plasma that was shooting out of the core of the galaxy and marking the spot of a supermassive black hole. So over decades, 2017, we hooked up this Earth-sized telescope and collected the data necessary to make the very first picture of a black hole. Uh, and two years later, after processing the data, this is what we saw. So this a ring of light is a signature of a black hole's event horizon. But since it's so far away from us, it appears incredibly small in the sky. It's about the same size as a grain of sand. But if that grain of sand is in New York, and I'm viewing it from where I am in Los Angeles. And so taking a picture of something that small required an international collaboration of scientists from all around the world, building new instruments and algorithms uh, to make it possible. So today I want to tell you a very, very abridged story of how we were able to take a picture of a black hole. And then this will help in motivating the majority of the talk today. We're going to be talking about techniques currently being developed in my group at Caltech to push the imaging of black holes past their current limits to see things that are still invisible to us. In particular, I'm going to be talking today about new machine learning approaches my group is developing for doing uncertainty quantification of images as well as how we're developing um, new kinds of approaches to recover not just the static properties of a black hole and, uh, and what the emission looks like, but also the dynamics of a black hole over the course of a night, how the gas is evolving around it. Okay, so let's get started. So again, why is taking a picture of a black hole so challenging? Well, because this black hole ring is so small, so teeny tiny, and can only see, be seen at a particular like range of wavelengths, that means diffraction limits require a telescope that was 13 million meters in size in order to see that event horizon scale structure. 13 million meters is essentially the size of the Earth. And so although we couldn't build a single dish telescope the size of the Earth, instead the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration spent over a decade joining telescopes located around the world to build a computational telescope the size of the Earth it was capable of resolving structure on the scale of a black hole's event horizon for the first time. So how does this computational telescope work? Well, unlike within a camera, it don't capture the picture in pixel space, but instead in frequency space. So we essentially are taking measurements of the black hole images Fourier transform. And if we put telescopes all across the globe, we would sample all these different spatial frequency measurements, but since we only have telescopes at a few locations, that means we only get a sparse number of measurements. And so it turns out that for every two telescopes we have in our telescope array, we obtain a single complex measurement of the underlying images 2D spatial frequency 
that's related to the projected baseline between the telescopes. Okay, but that means that if we only have a small number of telescopes, then we only have a small number of measurements to work with. And this is particularly challenging for the Event Horizon Telescope because in 2017, we observed with eight different telescopes around the world, but actually only five of those telescopes could see the black hole in M87 and we're at unique locations. So that means we'd only have at most five choose two, which is only 10 measurements that we'd have to make a picture from. It's a super small number of measurements, but luckily, as the Earth is rotating, we actually obtain other new measurements. So since the projected baselines between telescopes change as the Earth rotates, this amounts to carving out different elliptical paths in the spatial frequency plane. So how do we make an image after extracting those kinds of measurements? Well, just to, um, to um, get you on board, like the telescopes that are close together are going to be measuring low spatial frequencies. So they tell you about the broad structure in the image. And to see the fine detail in the image, you got to put your telescopes really far apart to see the high frequency structure. So now we have just a little bit of information about different frequency structures in the image. And so at this point, we can kind of, we have this data and we can kind of abstract away the astrophysics of it and think of it as just purely a mathematical inverse problem. We have this sparse data and our challenge is to invert the measurements to find the image that caused it. And if we were given measurements that covered the entire frequency plane, this would be trivial. In the case of no noise, you would just simply need to apply an inverse Fourier transform to the measurements to get back a picture. But since we only see a few samples, that means that there's an infinite number of possible images that are perfectly consistent with the data we measure. And on top of that, the fact that there's a different and quickly changing atmosphere above each of the telescopes across the globe causes our data to be very noisy and the problem becomes even more ill-posed. So to solve for the black hole image, we had to develop a number of different techniques to challenge this kind of, uh, to handle this challenging inverse problem. One of those techniques we referred to as regularized maximum likelihood estimation, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with as, uh, um, with the, as with the, the general idea. But just to briefly summarize, you know, we model the forward telescope system as a function f of x that returns the data we'd likely see, y hat, if the true image in the sky were x. But since we don't observe all measurements, since we have sparse data, that means that there's an infinite number of images that are going to give us the exact same y hats. That's making the problem L-posed. But although there's an infinite number of solutions that are equally likely in terms of the measurement likelihood of the images that are consistent with the measure, measured data, there are some that we consider you know, being more likely than others. For instance, um, perhaps we think the image on the left is too messy, and we per prefer images that are sparse or compact. And thus our goal becomes to find an image that doesn't just fit the data, but is likely under some sort of uh, model of good or likely images. And so using this idea, we incorporate this image prior or regularizer that essentially scores the quality of the images. And we solve this kind of Bayesian inspired uh, um, optimization problem. And so by solving for an image that maximizes both the data likelihood and the prior, we can whittle down from the infinite possibilities to a single one that we think is a likely image that fits the data well, even in the presence of all the different kinds of crazy noise that we experience. Okay, so now in an incredibly hand wavy way, I told you how we could go from sparse noisy measurements to a single image, but how do we actually write that mathematically? Well, um, it looks something like this. We're solving an optimization problem where we're trying to find the image X that maximizes the posterior probability conditioned on the observed measurements y. And as you all know, by simply rewriting this using Bayes' rule, we can see that maximizing this log posterior probability is equivalent to maximizing the sum over the data log likelihood and the log image prior. Those two terms that you know, we just discussed in that hand wavy way, uh, the first one being the data fit and the one, second one being the, um, the image's uh, likelihood. But note that even if we can develop methods such as these to recover a single image, we always have to be super cautious. And that's because any imaging method we come up with, whether it's a regularized maximum likelihood approach like I'm showing here, or a fancy new machine learning approach, it's always gonna require that we inject some additional information into the problem about what images look like to recover something back in the end. 
In the case of the regularized maximum likelihood problem, it was through the prior, which uh, is highlighted here in yellow. And this injection of additional information always is going to bias our final picture. And for instance, we didn't want to have a preference for ring images, even subconsciously, and then be super excited that we recovered a ring back in the end for the black hole. And so that meant a big question we faced in dealing with the M87 black hole data was not just how to make an image, but how do we verify that what we're reconstructing with our imaging algorithms is actually real? And we tackled this by approaching the imaging problem in many different ways. One way we tackled it is by developing three different imaging pipelines. You can download these pipelines along with the actual M87 data online. So it's all published online, so you can download it, run the map of yourself, develop new approach, better approaches. Um, but we originally designed these pipelines to kind of have different hyperparameter knobs on them that control different modeling and optimization choices when solving for the, uh, the best image. So for instance, for these regularized maximum likelihood pipelines, you have things like which, uh, which image priors to use or image regular, regularizers to use. Typically, these kind of hyperparameters, like not just what the regularizer is, but the weight on the regularizer, are often tuned by a human user. But instead of having a human tune them, we instead wanted to search for the best set of hyperparameter settings that best recover different types of source structures and then see how those settings influence the M87 images that we recovered for the black hole. For instance, we generated synthetic data as if the Event Horizon Telescope were actually seeing a disk on the sky that didn't have a hole in the center. And then we found the best set of parameters beta here to recover this disk shape. So we searched for all the, across all the different parameters and found the betas that best recovered that disk from the data, from the synthetic data. Then when we transferred these exact parameters beta onto the M87 data, we found that although we had tried our hardest to find parameters that recovered a disk with no hole in the center, our algorithm still required us to put a hole there when using the real data. And so by doing this very simple training and testing procedure on different types of underlying sources that we thought could trick us, then we saw our methods always preferred this kind of ring shape. And that was true no matter the day we observed M87 on or the imaging code that we used to reconstruct it. And by, um, so here we're showing the different uh, four different days we observed M87 on and three different imaging pipelines. And then we blurred the images from the different imaging pipelines to an equivalent resolution and then averaged those to form the image that we showed everyone back in 2019. This ring of light surrounding the black hole roughly 40 micro arc seconds in size and brighter on the bottom than the top. And so this kind of shows what we believed was the consistent structure that we got across all different types of imaging uh, pipelines with different imaging choices. These, this was kind of the consistent structure that we saw across them all. Okay, so our goal here was to try to remove human bias from the final images as much as possible and use simple training and testing data to select hyperparameter modeling choices. And so this prevented us from tweaking parameters too much by hand to get an image that we just wanted in the end. You know, um, even if we were subconsciously doing this, we, we didn't wanna, we wanted to avoid those kind of situations. And by doing this, we did end up getting this ring shape, which was incredibly exciting. But it doesn't answer the question of what is the uncertainty in this image? You know, how likely was this ring? Did we just get lucky with the parameter choices that we made? And so how did we go about um, um, doing that, evaluating uncertainty? So previously I talked about how we selected one set of parameters beta that performed best on synthetic data, but why should there only be one parameter set we, that we consider? In fact, by doing large parameter surveys, we found that there are often many parameters that actually perform reasonably well on synthetic data sets. So instead of selecting just one set of betas, we instead set a threshold and we found all the beta parameters that performed above this threshold on synthetic data. So for example, for one of the imaging pipelines, we ran hundreds of thousands of different simulations and found about 1500 per parameters that we deemed acceptable by doing the tests on synth the synthetic data. And once we had those 1500 parameters, we could apply them to the M87 data and see what variations existed. 
Okay, so again, we have these 1500 parameters. So we get 1500 different types of M87 images for one survey. And, and, and let's look across the, 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 for the variations here. So in the left, you're seeing the average uh, image that we kind of got across those, those different uh, 1500 images. And in the middle is the standard deviation that we saw across them. Um, so remember where this, this, uh, these different images are coming from different hyperparameter choices that, that still perform well on a synthetic data set. So the standard deviation here is telling us where there are variations in those images. And you notice that there are different variations across them. So if you look along the ring, you see these three different knot structures. Um, um, and those, those knots basically tell us that in those locations, we have less constraints on the in exact uh, intensity uh, along the ring. And this makes sense because of, the, uh, of an interplay between the source structure and the point spread function of our telescope system that we're working with. But if you actually look at the value of the standard deviation relative to the mean image, and you do this by looking at the fractional standard deviation, you can see that actually um, we that, that, that standard deviation is much lower than how bright the ring is. And so although we are a little unsure of the, the exact intensity, that ring structure always existed basically across all our images that we created. But what really varied a lot was all the wispy structure on the outside. So basically you shouldn't believe any of the kind of wispy stuff because that changes uh, drastically across different imaging choices. Okay, but I wanna strongly highlight here that what we're doing is probing different modeling choices and seeing how those choices actually affect the results that we get. So in the regularized maximum likelihood problem, we're essentially changing something like our prior term and then seeing how that prior or regularizer affected our results. And that is definitely something that was very important to explore because we do have uncertainty in what that prior should be. But it's important to note that this is not a posterior distribution. It's not directly quantifying uncertainty due to the data under a fixed prior model. For instance, oftentimes the energy landscape that you're optimizing is really bumpy and finding a global maximum is a challenge. But even if you're super lucky to find uh, this optimization, uh, to solve this optimization problem well in order to find a global maximum, there's nothing to say that there isn't another solution that isn't almost as good Oops. Uh, that you shouldn't also consider. And so this ends up being a really significant challenge, especially for black hole imaging, where the problem is non-convex and the energy landscape, landscape can be super bumpy. So we wanna be able to not just find you know, the best image, but wanna find other images that are comparable and see how that affects the results that we get, the interpretations. So as just an example of, of this, here is a synthetic image of a black hole on the left. And we took this image and we generated synthetic telescope data from it as if the event horizon telescope were seeing this image on the sky. And so now that we have this fake telescope data, we could use this mock data set and run our typical regularized maximum likelihood uh, methods on it to see what um, results we got. And we noticed for this particular data set that every time we ran the methods with slightly different initialization, we recovered different results. In some of the images, the bright spot was on the top right. And in some cases, the bright spot was on the bottom left. And by evaluating the data likelihood, it appeared that both modes actually fit the data pretty well. And, and so it was very hard to decide just by looking at the data fits, which one was actually the true image structure. And this is actually not that rare of an occurrence in black hole imaging because of the crazy noise that we experience on our measurements. We have to solve this non-convex optimization problem similar to a phase retrieval problem. And that sometimes has multiple solutions. And so this is a bit scary, right? Because it means that we had to manually explore the space of possibilities in this case in order to see these two di very different uh, possibilities. And if this was real data and we didn't do this, we would be missing out on potentially an image that could lead to a very different scientific interpretation. And so for problems like this, it's so important that we have ways to efficiently, efficiently visualize the space of possibilities. In other words, instead of computing a point estimate like the regularized maximum likelihood optimization does, 
we want to instead be able to sample from the full posterior distribution the probability of x given y in order to visualize the full solution space. Oftentimes, posterior estimation is achieved using sampling methods such as Markov chain Monte Carlo or, or other kinds of sampling. However, the sampling and rejection approach can be prohibitively slow and computationally expensive for high dimensional inverse problems. And so to tackle this, we recently have been developing new methods for efficient posterior exploration by exploiting deep learning machinery for the purpose of visualizing uncertainty. In particular, we aim to learn a deep generative model to approximate the posterior samples of an imaging inverse problem. So let's start by reviewing the, the deep generative model. You'll see why in a minute. So, you know, I'm sure you all are very familiar with the great success of deep generative models in computer vision and machine learning. So, you know, what are these generative networks? Well, given enough training images, we can train a neural network that takes as input some random noise and outputs a picture that looks like a real scene at first glance. And by plugging in different noise images, you'll get different output pictures. So why am I telling you about this? Well, these deep um, neural networks define an implicit distribution over the space of images. And these impressive results that we've seen in the generative model uh, literature um, show that these networks allow us to learn very flexible and expressive distributions that capture complex correlations in high dimensional images. So inspired by these generative models, my postdoc Hassan and I have been developing an approach to sample from a posterior distribution using a learned generative neural network. So our goal here is to learn the weights phi of a neural network, such that if you pass different random input noise Z to the neural network, out is going to pop a sample from the image reconstruction posterior. And different input noise just is going to result in different posterior sample images. Essentially, the neural network is just learning a mapping from a noise distribution to the target image's posterior distribution. OK, so how should we train a network to give us these posterior samples? Well, unlike in the case of the bedroom generator, we don't have a training set of images to use. You know, if we had, if we did, if we had a training set of images uh, from the image reconstruction posterior to train the network, then we would be done, right? Because there would be no need to learn a neural network to generate samples if we already have samples from the posterior. The only data we have for optimizing the neural network is the sparse and noisy measurement data Y of a single hidden image. And so in our approach, which we call deep probabilistic imaging or DPI for short, instead of using a collection of training images to solve for the neural network, as is typically done in other computer vision problems, we instead found that we could define a loss that is minimized when the weights of the neural network result in a distribution of network generated images that best matches the true image posterior. So this is done by min minimizing some sort of divergence, such as the KL divergence between these two distributions. And so solving this problem in this way actually ends up being a very specific type of variational uh, of a variational method. And just as a refresher in variational methods, we define a simple family of density functions, for instance, Q phi here, visualized by the blue space of distribution. So every point in that space is a distribution. And then we solve for an, optim an optimization problem to find the parameters phi that best match the target posterior distribution shown here by the yellow star. OK, but then the question becomes, you know, like what should this family of di variational distributions be that we're searching over? Traditionally, you know, they were tipped typically pretty simple so that you could solve the necessary integrals and efficiently evaluate probabilities. So oftentimes things, simple things like Gaussian distributions are, are used for this. But in, um, in deep probabilistic imaging, by using a neural network, we can define a very flexible family of distributions parameterized by phi, um, that, which are the network weights in this case. And this flexible family of distributions can better capture the image posterior distributions that we're interested in targeting. So actually, DPI's optimization problem um, is, um, is, not just, can, can, is not just thought of as a variational inference problem, but it can also be intuitively derived 
by extending the regularized maximum likelihood estimation method. So the Kale divergence between the neural network image distribution and that of the post of the true posterior can actually be rewritten as the expected log likelihood plus an entropy term where that entropy term is basically encouraging the distribution to not collapse to a single solution. So if you ignore that entropy term, it would just be trying to find a neural network that you know, finds the best image, again, just kind of solving like that regularized maximum likelihood problem. But that entropy forces you to have some, um, some variety in the images that come out in the end. And it, it turns out that this actual equation is equivalent to minimizing the, the KL divergence as well. And so that means in addition to understanding DPI as a variational inference method, it can also be regarded as just a natural extension, extension to doing uncertainty quantification for irregularized maximum likelihood estimation problems. And it's actually kind of funny. We actually approached the problem in that direction originally and then realized that it's actually just converged to the same thing as, as using the, the KL divergence in this particular case. Okay, so one thing uh, worth noting here is that in order to optimize this loss function that we're that, um, that I've written here, we need our generative model to be efficient in both generating samples and evaluating the likelihood of an arbitrary image. But normal generative models like GANs and VAEs are only good at generating samples, but you can't easily evaluate a sample's likelihood to compute that entropy loss. So this is that last term is the probability of a particular image X um, under your um, learned distribution Q here. So in order to accomplish both of these goals, in order to not just generate, but also evaluate the probability of a, of a random image, in DPI, we use an invertible generative model, uh, a normalizing flow network. And this type of network can ex be executed in both directions. And as a result, we can easily generate samples from noise using the forward pass and then easily compute the entropy loss using the inverse pass. Okay, so how does this end up working? Well, let's go back to that black hole example that I introduced earlier. So remember that for that ground truth image on the top, there ended up being multiple solutions that the regularized maximum likelihood estimation would con uh, converge to when we would reinitialize. So we'd initialize with different images. And every time we initialize with a different image, it would converge to a different kind of solution, right? And so then we tested our deep probabilistic imaging approach on this data set um, to learn an approximate posterior dis distribution. So remember, we have that one data set. We, um, we learn the parameters of our network to, uh, and once we've learned those, that network, then we fix it and we just pass random noise through it to sample approximate posterior uh, samples. And on the bottom right are some samples that come out of the learned neural network. And as you can see in our learned network, it's able to capture a posterior distribution that also indicates there are two modes in our data. And it doesn't require any manual tuning or initialization or anything like that. It just naturally falls out. And another nice thing to highlight here is that it can capture these multiple modes that are, uh, that are very different. Whereas things like Gaussian distributions are very hard to capture that multimodal structure that you often see in these posterior distributions. But perhaps the most interesting thing is what happens when we run it on some real data. So this is a result we got when we ran the approach on real M87 black hole data. And what I find really encouraging is that if you compare the standard deviation in the resulting images to the standard deviation we had published earlier, you can see that they're amazingly similar. Although these standard deviation maps re represent slightly different things, you know, they're still kind of comparable. And in both of the uncertainty maps, it ends up that there are these three regions with the highest uncertainty that seem to match up. And so this was super exciting to me when I saw this result, since actually the very first time Ha ran his method on the real M87 data, he got nearly the same result that it took an entire group of scientists from around the world months to achieve through these grueling parameter surveys that I talked about. And it only took about one hour of training time on a single GPU. So I'm really excited to be making progress on methods that don't just allow us, that allow us to better understand our uncertainty in these computational imaging systems um, at more of an accelerated uh, uh, rate. And it also turns out that uh, we found that this DPI framework is not just useful for black hole imaging, but useful for many different types of problems. Here are just a few of the applications that we've been using in, um, it for 
in our group from seismic tomography, planet orbit fitting. But let's get back uh, to the black hole again. Uh, so this image tells us so much uh, about the immediate environment around a black hole um, and it helps us to get better constraints on our understanding of gravity. And so, you know, we've but per, and we've learned a lot from it already, but perhaps the most amazing thing um, to me is that by comparing this picture to simulations scientists have made for years, we find that the image that we, um, that we took was amazingly consistent with a number of these predictions. But you might have noticed that the simulation I just showed you was actually moving. So you might wonder, you know, is our recovered M87 image also moving? And in fact, it turns out that it is. So another interesting thing is that um, if you string together the images that we recovered, so we, we actually um, imaged, uh, so we collected data of M87 over the course of an entire week. We had two days at the beginning of the week and two days at the end of the week. And we independently imaged each one of these data sets. And if you string these, uh, these data sets into, you can make a very short movie with four frames. And when you play them as a movie, you'll actually notice that there's some variation across them. There's some evolution that exists over the week. So I'll play it for you here. It's really hard to see, so I'm gonna play it again. You'll notice that the bright spot moves more from the left down to the bottom. So studying evolution like this is, is quite exciting because it not only gives a window into the dynamics around a black hole and therefore hopefully gives us an understanding of how these powerful galactic scale jets are forming, but it also helps us in mapping the space time of a black hole and constraining our prediction of general relativity even further. But actually the black hole in M87 is not the only black hole we're interested in imaging to get a handle on the question of time variability. In the heart of our own Milky Way galaxy, 26,000 light years away from us, there's this cluster of stars. And by peering past all the galactic dust with infrared telescopes, astronomers have mapped the path of this cluster of stars over decades. And by tracking the motions of the stars over time, astronomers have concluded that the only thing small and dense enough to cause this motion has to be a supermassive black hole. In fact, this discovery led to the Nobel Prize in Physics given last year for the work of Andrea Ghez and Reinhard Genzel for the discovery of a supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy, otherwise known as Sagittarius A star. And so as awesome as the black hole in M87 has been, Sagittarius A star, or what we like to call Sag A star for short, might be able to help us better answer some of these questions. So M87 is massive. It's six and a half billion solar masses. And Sag A star is teeny tiny compared to M87. It's a measly four million solar masses. But that means that the gas orbits around it much more quickly. So whereas it takes four to 30 days for gas to make a complete orbit around M87, for Sag A star, gas makes a full orbit every four to 30 minutes. And so we'd like to be able to image the time variations around Sag A star, but doing so is really difficult. Why is that? Well, remember that the data that we use to recover a black hole image is taken over the course of an entire night. As the Earth is rotating, we collect different measurements that together we use to make the M87 image. So for the M87 image, we throw those all together in one big pot and then we solve for one static image that fits all those measurements. But since Sagittarius star is actually evolving over the time span of just minutes, that means that every measurement we make is from a different snapshot of the black hole. So how should we go about capturing the black hole's evolution? Well, if we were just to apply the same static imaging methods as before to try to reconstruct each snapshot using just the small amount of data, the small number of measurements we see at each time, the data is just far too sparse to use this approach and results in uninformative images. So clearly this naive approach isn't going to work. So how should we capture and learn about the black hole's evolution? Well, we've been working on ways to extract what black hole motion we observe. And the first approach we took was to develop methods to reconstruct full movies of the black hole evolving over time. However, if you thought recovering a static image is a hard ill post problem, this ends up being orders of magnitude more challenging because we have the exact same number of, of measurements, but now we have to solve for all the pixels in a full movie rather than just a single frame. 
And so to get around this, you often have to include a significant amount of temporal regularization into the optimization problem in order to get a good result. But you end up having to crank that regularization up so much that oftentimes the reconstruction you're able to achieve is missing all the rich dynamics that you're really after. So here on the left is showing a synthetic ground truth video. And on the right is a video reconstruction obtained from this measurement, assuming uh, we're assuming measurements are coming from something like the EHT array, but we're reconstructing that full movie with the temporal regularization. And so here in this, in this reconstruction on the right, we've recovered something like the average structure and you do see some of the evolution in it, but this video has lost a lot of the information about how the gas is actually flowing around the, the black hole. Like what is the, that wispy structure? What is the angle of those wisps that are coming off and things like that that are really important. And these dynamics are kind of totally lost here. So although imaging is crucial in making sure that we give ourselves the flexibility to see something surprising, perhaps if our ultimate, if our ultimate goal is to understand the underlying motion field, this might not be the right approach. Alternatively, you could also imagine wanting to describe the underlying flow using a physical model of black holes. For instance, we could search in the space of black hole uh, of parameters that produce different synthetic black hole videos and try to find the parameter setting that best matches the data we've observed. And while this theoretically may be possible to do, in reality, this is just too computationally expensive. Just simulating 60,000 60, static image snapshots um, that we did for the M87 papers took over 75 million core hours to complete. So um, optimizing or sampling over this space would be incredibly challenging. Not to mention that it might not, it, it's likely not even the right model of black holes. <laughs> and so there's this spectrum of different approaches one can take in trying to recover the underlying motion of a source. On one end is recovering a non-parametric flow field, which is maximally flexible, but requires us to recover a movie of how, uh, uh, a movie of the flow field. And in the end, it's not necessarily all that interpretable. And on the other end of the spectrum is estimating the parameters of a physics-based black hole model. And while this result would be maximally interpretable, the approach has the disadvantage that we're tied to a black hole model that's not necessarily correct and therefore overly restrictive. And so rather than pick one, picking one of these extremes, we would like to find some sort of middle ground. Use a model that balances the pros and cons of these different approaches while being still computationally efficient. And towards that end, we've been working on modeling the persistent evolution of black hole sources as the result of a stochastic infection diffusion process, and then solving for the underlying parameters of this model that best fit the observed measurements. So this intermediate option, which I'll go into, tries to find an interpretable compression of the motion field by asking us to only match the persistent motion statistics. This work is being led by Aviad Levis, who's a postdoc in my group, but also with our uh, black hole physics collaborators, David and Charles, who are at UIUC, as well as Joel Trapp from Caltech. So let's dive in to understand a bit better. So here I'm showing the equation of a stochastic partial differential equation, PDE here, describing an advection diffusion process. Don't worry about understanding the equation. I'll just point out the relevant components. You don't have to understand uh, the full thing. So in this process, there are two parameters that we really care about, V and D, where V is the velocity field that describes how the bulk is moving, and D is the diffusion field, which describes how material kind of spreads out in space. So for instance, uh, these two cups uh, contain water with different non-isotropic diffusion fields resulting in the dye spreading out differently in them. So therefore you could imagine describing the motion of the dye using a PDD like this with different underlying parameters D. So in this work, we use a black hole motivated fluid model to parameterize each of the fields with one parameter each, theta one and theta two. And by solving this equation for rho, we can, uh, we can obtain movies that obey the subvection diffusion process under different parameter settings theta. For instance, for this particular choice of theta one and theta two, this input random noise produces a rho that has this kind of swirling structure. And by tuning these parameters appropriately, those theta parameters, you can see that we can produce flow fields from this model that when paired with a physically motivated envelope 
mimic that of a smoothly evolving black hole simulation. And actually these often trick me that they actually are, look so similar to some of the um, black hole simulations. Okay, so great. Our goal is then to find the parameters theta here that best describe our observed source motion. But there's a catch. And that's that this is a stochastic partial differential equation, meaning that the fluid flow movie that we get is dependent on, the, on this input forcing term epsilon. And therefore, two random fields with the same underlying velocity and diffusion parameters result in very different pixel values over time. Therefore, a key challenge to estimating the dynamics is that the pixel values are driven by this unknown random source, which we don't want to estimate. And so an insight of our work is by using dimensionality reduction, we can ignore this epsilon term altogether when determining the parameters that best fit the dynamics of a random field. So roughly, how does this work? Well, for a given parameter set, we extract the top modes, which capture most of the variability of the stochastic partial differential equation for those particular parameters that we're looking at. As we don't actually have access to a matrix operator, getting those top modes is actually a challenge um, that we have to use uh, matrix free methods, but I'm, I'm happy to discuss that later with anyone that has questions. But once we get those modes, then we can just simply compute the projection of the random field that we see onto the subspace spanned by those modes. And if the subspace represents the random field well, then that projection, then that projection residual will be small. But parameters that are different from those that generated the random field that we see around the black hole will result in a subspace that does not capture the random field well. Therefore, that kind of projection residual will be high. And so by computing the projection residual for different parameters, we estimate the underlying true parameters as the global minimum to this projection residual loss function. And then once we've done that, we can take the global, uh, the optimal motion parameters here, um, theta one and theta two, that parameterize the velocity and diffusion fields, and then use it to draw a sample fluid flow that have the same parameters. So again, you're gonna have the same kind of flow structure, although the particular um, intensity values at every pixel over time will be different from the true um, from the true video. But by merging this flow realization with an envelope that we optimize jointly with the dynamic parameters, we can generate a movie that we believe is kind of sampled from a similar stationary distribution as the true underlying video of the black hole. You know, obviously these are different. This fluid flow model is not at all a model of black hole dynamics. But notice how the video on the right is able to recover things like the direction of the flow and also the behavior of the wispy structure that are seen in the black hole simulation using an actual model of black holes on the left hand side. And so the big advantage of this approach is that the parameters to be extract are still interpretable while still being flexible enough to see something somewhat surprising. Um, and, uh, and we can use these parameters then to back out scientific um, interpretations such as the black hole spins value. Okay, but if you've played close attention, you'll notice that I assumed I actually had the true video of the black hole in the sky in order to calculate this projection residual that was used in our loss. But we actually don't have that black hole video, right? Um, instead, we only have these sparse and noisy measurements that we collect over time. So what are we supposed to do here? Well, actually, it turns out to be a quite simple extension mathematically to optimize in the measurement space. And when we only have measurements to constrain the flow of parameters, we can still recover the dynamics decently, even with just sparse measurements that mimic those that could be captured with a very sparse event horizon telescope array. In this result, you know, we get something like the general rotation of motion. We're able to extract something like that out of it but it definitely looks a lot worse than what we saw before. We don't have the same kind of um, resolution um, in understanding kind of the structure of the wispies uh, that come off the black hole. It's just kind of like this general rotation that we get. And so as important as it is to continue pushing on the algorithmic, algorithmic approaches like this to squeeze more out of our data, it's also important to realize that to extract more science, we also have to think about improving not just our algorithms that analyze the data, but also our instrument that collects the data to begin with. And to that end, we've been working on improving the actual Event Horizon Telescope network. In 2017, we only observed with telescopes at um, eight different telescopes that were at six different locations. 
And since then, we've been building out our array to get more data, adding telescopes in Greenland, France, Arizona. And then the one I'm most excited about is we uh, recently got funding to add a telescope at Caltech's Owens Valley Observatory. So it's fun that uh, my, my new home, Caltech, is being, uh, becoming part of the EHT telescope as well. But this is really just the beginning. Our goal is to add at least 10 more telescopes around the world, filling up the measurement space so we can get much better data and much better results. And by using a proposed future array, we've been already starting to see that we can improve our dynamic results from something like this using the much sparser array to something more, uh, like this, recovering fluid flow model that is incredibly similar to the best fitting model when we use the actual black hole movie directly. And so using this approach, we may be able to recover not just the general structure of a black hole in the center of our galaxy, but actually capture the properties of the gas as it circles towards the event horizon. But we're not done there. In fact, we've recently been trying to take this one step further, actually trying to inject more knowledge about our underlying physics in order to recover the dynamic environment around the black hole in 3D. So I'm just gonna very briefly uh, explain this uh, real fast because I find it fairly exciting. So light propagating near a black hole doesn't actually follow straight lines. It's curved because the black hole is curving space time, space time and photons can even go in complete circles around it. So we have all these photons flying around everywhere from the hot spinning gas. Some of them are too close uh, or are pointed in and they fall into the black hole. But the ones that are farther away, they just raise it and they get pulled around. And the net effect is that the black hole basically casts a shadow on the bright surrounding emission that's almost perfectly circular. And this bending of light is referred to as gravitational lensing and causes all those ring-like images that I've been showing you throughout this presentation. Um, but if you plug in all the physics, um, then actually this ring looks more like something like this due to non-uniformities in the spinning gas. And you might actually notice that every once in a while, you get a little bright flare that comes up, something that we call hot spots. And tracking these hot spots is super important scientifically because watching how they evolve and shear out gives us a window into the space time around the black hole and helps us in mapping out the, those properties. So being able to actually map these hot spots around the black hole would be super exciting and lead to a huge scientific gain. But how should we actually go about seeing these hot spots in three, three dimensions? Well, we have been, well, we only have those gravitate, in reality, we don't have the information in 3D. We only have the gravitationally lens 2D projections from one orientation in the sky. And in fact, we even have less than that. We only have the measurements of these two dimensional projections over time. But by building in our expected knowledge about the physics and uh, around the black hole and um, about how the lensing is supposed to operate, um, along with modern ideas in deep learning, uh, deep learned neural radiance fields, we've been able to demonstrate that it may be possible in the future to actually do 3D reconstruction of the environment around a black hole over time, basically doing black hole emission tomography by connecting our understanding of physics um, uh, and injecting that even though we're only observing from one direction. So this is hot off the press, something I'm super excited about and I hope to be able to tell you more uh, a little later. So to close, it's clear we've learned a lot from this image of the black hole in M87 already. But what I hope I got across in the talk today is that really we're just at the beginning and there's still so much to come. And hopefully one day we'll be able to show you not just a static image of a black hole, but a movie of a black hole as the gas is slowly falling towards its event horizon and perhaps even in three dimensions one day. And so with that, I wanna thank the amazing team of Event Horizon Telescope collaborators that I work with on a daily basis, a team that's still very hard in work, in fact, holding our first in-person meeting for the US contingent for a couple of years, um, for a couple of years, just a couple of weeks ago. And in particular, I wanna highlight the Hassan and Aviad Levis who have done, um, been great and have led the two projects that I discussed primarily today. So thank you so much and I'm happy to take any questions.